Thank you, Alana. Um, welcome, everyone, and thank you for coming. In, in sort of thinking about this talk tonight, it actually occurred to me there are so many things that we might want to talk about, and just about any one of them could occupy us for the whole night. So what we will try and do is cover a number of topics quite briefly and try and leave time for your questions. So bear with me if you think we're jumping about. Um, there's just an awful lot to talk about. I'd like to start, Sharon, with, with you, obviously. And Ilana has mentioned uh, the Association for Civil Rights in Israel, of which, for which you work. Can you tell us more about it and the history and why it was founded and interesting cases that you have? Hi, good evening. Uh, I'm glad to be in Melbourne. I wish the weather was a little bit better, but... Uh, <laughs> it will be, okay. Hi, so uh, I'm... Uh, Honored to uh, to head an organization called the Association for Civil Rights in Israel, which is the oldest and largest human rights organization in Israel, established in uh, 1972 by North American scholars, uh, copying the modeling of the American Civil Liberties uh, Union, trying to bring the Israel to Israel the notion of uh, civil liberties and uh, doing some action mainly in the in the legal way. So I happen to be a lawyer, but my main passion is social change. And uh, in order to do a social change, it's not enough to have one tool in your toolkit. So being a lawyer is, is one thing, but in our organization, we have uh, lawyers, but we have also an education department because I don't believe you can do a social change without education. And also a public outreach department that is, is dealing with uh, new media, all the media, social uh, uh, networks and, and others. So the whole thing is focused on universal human rights. And in the, in the past few decades, we, we made a tremendous change in the Israeli uh, reality with uh, landmark cases, and I'll do some name dropping. Uh, in the 90s, we, have, we had a famous case about equality for women. There was a young woman who came from South Africa who wanted to be a pilot in the Israeli Defense Forces, which is uh, compulsory to all the Jews in Israel. And she, when she joined the army, uh, she's been told it's impossible. And she said, why is it impossible? Uh, it was impossible because she's, she was a woman. And the, everybody was criticizing us at the time. We were doing this case together with the Israeli Women Network, uh, saying, how can you challenge the Israeli Defense Forces? How can you def the, uh, challenge the institutions? And uh, we, we won that case, and it's one of the landmark cases speaking about equality for women in Israel. Uh, identifying that harming your e equality is humiliating and hence it's a discrimination in the end of the day. At the same decade, we had a famous case about LGBTQ community rights for uh, same-sex couples. Uh, later, on, we, later on, we had uh, case, um, landmark cases for the Arab minority in Israel in housing and, and so on and so on. So, uh, so it's mostly legal work, but not only, because we are doing two things. We are defending human rights, that's what we are doing in, in courts, but we are also promoting a discourse of universal uh, human rights. As you certainly do, and we'll come to that. And so, have you always been a human rights lawyer? So, <laughs> was there a I moment? I was born a human rights lawyer. No. <laughs> <laughs> no, but uh, were you, you you never wanted to be a high flying corporate lawyer? No, never. What, did some? Was there some reason? What What is it? Okay, so um, I think each each one of us uh, uh, reflects on where they're coming from. I grew up in a lot in the south of Israel. Uh, my parents were both immigrants, so my, my father came from India, my mother was from a Holocaust survivor's descendant family, and I think it's a, it's a combination of growing up in the periphery of Israel, far away from, from the center, and being a daughter of immigrants. I couldn't really do anything else in my life apart from being a human rights lawyer. <laughs> now, of course, Gillian needs no introduction. G Gillian, um, her achievements at the Human Rights Commission are such that you, you were given a standing ovation when you got on a plane, a full plane leaving Canberra not so long ago, <laughs> which is, is absolutely fantastic. Um, and you say in your book, and I'll just 
show it here, the book, which I, I highly recommend, actually, and uh, Gillian will be signing some copies afterward. Um, you said that when you were offered the job at the Human Rights Commission, you found your public voice, and not only that, you discovered that you had something to say, but you also describe yourself as growing up as a, as a timid, softly spoken, would-be ballet dancer. So, what happened? <laughs> <laughs> Lovely question. Uh, well, first of all, can I say it's wonderful to see so many of you here this evening and a huge privilege for me to be with Sharon and to have Debbie here, who's done such wonderful work also in some of the fields that I've been working on, but particularly uh, exciting, in a way, uh, to know that uh, Israel and Australia have so much in common uh, in, in terms of the way in which we fail to deal with some fundamental human rights uh, issues. I was not, frankly, aware of that um, until I did a little bit of research for this evening. So uh, it's a huge honour for me to, to be with you, and I'm looking forward to the discussion. To answer your question, um, uh, you know, I'm not really sure quite uh, what happened and how it happened, but I, um, I'm an immigrant too. I'm a 10-pound, what's known as a 10-pound pommy migrant. It cost you 10 pounds to get your ticket to come in 1958 with my family. Uh, from London. And um, I really became, I think, um, a pretty traditional black letter lawyer. And I did aspire to be a high flying lawyer. I did a lot of international commercial law work, um, uh, oil and gas companies, and so on. Um, but I'd have to say that from my very earliest days of life in London, I always had this strong sense of, um, of fairness which I think was from my parents, having been in the war, uh, my father a tank commander and my mother with the Royal Navy, um, they'd fought that war for the principles of equality and, and opportunity. And I think that sort of by osmosis came to me. So when I was given the opportunity to be president of the Australian Human Rights Commission, I, by Nicola Roxon, I might add, the first woman ever to be appointed an attorney in this country, um, I was, of course, very honoured to take it. So that's really how I moved from being a black letter commercial international lawyer to... A, a left-wing radical activist <laughs> of dubious legal skills as far as the government was concerned. I know we're going to talk about the shrinking de democratic space, which we are going to talk about, but there's also a, a pretty important topic that comes up in your book and I think is, is of great relevance to many of us here tonight, which is women. Um, and you, Gillian, in your book, you actually make this quite strong call to women to rediscover rage and not be afraid of failure, you say. And you say, for too long, we've worn the pearl earrings and the smart jackets, we've absorbed the values of a male-dominated world, but we haven't seen the benefits. Now, you seem to still be wearing the jackets and the I earrings, <laughs> but you <laughs> haven't <laughs> done that. I mean, do you, do you really think it is time for us to break the cycle as women? It hasn't worked, what we've tried? I, I really do believe this now. Um, we've been in regression um, as women in Australia for the last uh, eight or ten years. We've moved in the global, um, the World Economic Forum's global index. We've moved from 15th, which is about where you'd expect us to be given other countries, uh, eight years ago. And over the last eight years, we've moved from 15th to 46th on the World Economic Forum. And that covers all sorts of things um, that you won't be surprised by, of course. Um, ministerial positions in government, economic participation, um, violence against women, uh, the superannuation um, uh, amount that Australian uh, women retire on, 46% of men. But on every indice that they examine in the World Economic Forum, we have been in serious regression now to 46th position. Um, and I must say, um, uh, Debbie, I, I was fact-checked on this. We have this in Australia. I imagine you, you do in Israel as well, but I was fact-checked on this statement by the ABC about three weeks ago, and I can confirm that everything I say got a tick and was fair and accurate. So I'm very confident in saying that's, <laughs> that is what's happened. I have no <laughs> doubt about that, Gillian. But then that brings us, of course, to Israel, Sharon, where of course, women in Israel, they don't need to wear pearl e earrings and jackets because they carry guns um, and they do national service. I mean, has that does that change? And, and I, I half say that flippantly, but I, I'm also curious about, has, has that made it easier for women to be treated equally in Israel? So it depends on feminism. Uh, it's not only be, being equal to men. I mean, mm -hmm. a woman True. carrying a gun doesn't make it more feminist in, in, in many ways. Uh, it's more about the substantial issues. I think historically, uh, I, 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 it, it's very interesting to, to hear you, Julian, because I feel that in the past couple of years in Israel, we have shrinking democratic space for women. And on top of what you're saying, although, although we had progress in numbers, in 
in many ways, on top of the problems here in Australia, the thing that is crucial in Israel is the no separation of state and religion. Mm -hmm. So the, all the marriage life and the personal level is dominated by the orthodox uh, Jewish law. So uh, marriage, uh, for example, cannot be in the civil way only by the rabbinical institution. Uh, I got married in the States. I chose to get married in, in the civil marriage in the States because I do not um, uh, perform orthodox way of living. I'm not orthodox. And my Jewish wedding that was performed in Israel was not recognized by the mm -hmm. state. And going back to the orthodox, there is... Uh, uh, not an equal treatment mm. for women. So on top of all the things we were discussing here, we have also uh, segregation for women in the, even in Orthodox uh, uh, synagogues and other places. Is that becoming and, uh, uh, more intense? Yes, it's becoming more intense. So Israel uh, joined the OECD, the developed <coughs> countries, 10 years ago. And uh, part of the benchmarks that were set to Israel is incorporation of the ultra-Orthodox community in the job market. Part of the encouraging the ultra-Orthodox men to participate in the job market is giving them higher education, which, which is, a, I think, it's a positive thing to have uh, integration in the, in the job market in general. It, two populations were targeted, the ultra-Orthodox men and uh, Arab women that are not, they are underrepresented in the job market comparing to their uh, share in the society. But what it created, that the government now is sponsoring a lot of high education for ultra-Orthodox, you would say, wow, that's wonderful, but it is segregated. Mm -hmm. So imagine sitting in gender classes or in constitutional law classes studying about equality, a class of only men and the teacher can be only a male professor. And we, we feel it in the public spaces. Uh, the main square in Tel Aviv, or Bin Square, there was an event this year with a mechitza, a barrier in the middle between men and women. And this is definitely not... In the main news. square in Tel Aviv. In, in Tel Aviv, square. in the main square in Tel Aviv, there was one event that was held by uh, ultra-Orthodox and they demanded that it will be separated and so it was. So I think that if you would tell me 10 years ago, if you would ask me if gender is an issue in Israel, I, said, I would say not more than any other place around the world, which is 30% wage gap. You know, which is not great, but it's it's not very bad. But now, it's it's more an, of an issue than it was five years ago. Mm. Mm. So, as Gillian has said, things are getting worse in Australia, and certainly Acri says that in Israel, you in fact said in your last report. And one thing that you do is these annual reports of where human rights are at, which is obviously a fantastic tool. But you in fact say that it appears that human rights in Israel have gone back in time. They've reached a new low. Are you, can you give us some examples of that and, and tell us more about why you say that? So we, we actually, it's under the title Shrinking Democratic Space. So uh, many things uh, like gender that we were speaking, that you would tell me 10 years ago that freedom of speech would be a problem, I would say, no, it's not a problem in Israel. And I think it's it's not only Israel, but we experience it in Israel. There, there, I'm active there. It's the uh, we. I think the liberal democracies, as we knew them, is taking a new form. It's changing. And if you connect the dots, I mean, look at Hungary, look at Poland, look at the United States, look at the Brexit and other places. So, all the notion of democracy is the rule of majority, together with defending minorities. And what we are saying slowly, slowly, that we are losing the part of the defending minorities and the majorities are passing laws one after the other that are entrenching the rule of the majority. This is one thing that we, we see in Israel. We witness two waves. I think the first wave was five, six years ago that there was legislation, and it's mainly by legislation that is led by the government, that uh, was harming the minorities. Uh, and the civil society. So we, we in what way? What what was uh, the most famous law uh, was the uh, anti NGO bill that is known as the transparency bill. Oh, just a second. Sorry, too much, too many flights. I guess. Mm -hmm. You've been making uh, Shakon work, work very hard since <laughs> she's come all the way to Australia. Uh, so. Uh, it's uh, 
those organizations, so I'm speaking, uh, uh, maybe I'll go backwards a little yes. bit. I'm speaking about constitutional law, but Israel has no constitution. So how do I refer to constitutional law? We have basic laws that are above uh, regular laws. And one day when we will have a constitution, these will be the chapters of the constitution. So meanwhile, we don't have a constitution. And uh, if the Supreme Court, when it's interpreting laws and it's uh, and laws are being brought to Supreme Court, challenge whether it's constitutional or, or not, the Supreme Court examines this law in the light these laws in the light of uh, the basic laws. For example, there is a basic law for uh, human dignity and freedom, and they have to check if it's violating uh, these laws. So. What is happening now, we see that there is a uh, separation of powers is being blurred. Supreme Court is under an, an attack now. Now I'll go backwards a little bit and I'll speak about, I, I said there were two waves. The first wave was attempt to harm the minority. Uh, in particular in Israel, the Arab minority. It's uh, maybe confusing, but I'll Put it, I'll try to put it in order. 20% of the Israeli citizens in Israel belong to the Arab minority, the Palestinian Israelis or Arab Israelis. Now, everything that I'm speaking about is about Israel in the 1948 borders, when I'm speaking about constitutional law. When we speak about the occupied territories that Israel occupied in 1967, it's a different story. It's occupation. These are refugees. We, we don't speak about the democracy when we deal with the occupied territories. But I'm referring to, uh, at this stage, to Israel itself. So the Arab minority, started, uh, which was never in, in power, they're 20%, they're represented in our Knesset, which is the parliament, and uh, was never represented in the coalition. And there were a couple of laws that passed in order to, uh, to minimize their, uh, their representation. So the most famous one, I think, is the nation state law that passed recently, and it's changing the status quo, I think, at the declarative level, but it, it is changing it. So Israel uh, originally calls itself a Jewish and democratic uh, state. That's how we define ourselves, and, and it's, sometimes it has frictions. It raises lots of qu questions. Some of them are being brought to Supreme Court. And, but th there are things that were not in dispute since the uh, beginning, establishment of Israel in 1948. There was the Declaration of Independence that spoke about Jewish and democratic state, that spoke about equality and respecting minority. This law that passed just now, recently, is changing the status quo by three, in three ways. The first one, it speaks about the language. The formal language in languages in Israel until this law was passed were two. Hebrew and Arabic. This law is, is saying the Arab language is not going to be a formal language anymore. It's going to have a special status. What does this special status mean? We don't know yet. No interpretation. The other thing is housing. So we, uh, ACRI had a case in uh, 2000 about housing. There was an Arab couple, Arab-Israeli couple, who wanted to leave uh, um, not far away from their village. If you have been to Israel, it's pretty clear the differences between Arab cities, towns, or villages, and uh, and Jew Jewish places. So if you'll if you'll unfold your your eyes and I'll move the folder and say where are you, you look around and you'll know exactly if it's Jewish or Arabic. The infrastructure is different. The sidewalks are different. The street lights are different. The playground for the kids are different. The schools are different. There is a big difference. And this couple, he was a nurse. She was a, a school teacher. They wanted a better education for their kids, and they could afford it. Both of them were working. It's very natural. I mean, people want a better education for, for the kids. So they decided to move not far away from there. There was a small... Uh, village, not, not a big place, and they, uh, they applied, they wanted to buy a house, and the village said, no, we do not want to accept Arabs over there. We, we took it to Supreme Court, we challenged it, and it's a beautiful verdict named Kadan that we won, that the Chief Justice at the time, Aaron Barak, was given in March 2000, said that equality means that you also live together, and there is no right to, to block housing for people because of their ethnic background. 
and uh, or the, or national uh, background. And uh, what happened later on, our Knesset bypassed this verdict by deciding that every place or village until 400 families inhabitants uh, is allowed to select its members, saying it's a small community, a small community can decide if I'm a community of vegetarians, I can decide not to accept carnivores. For, this for is example. a huge revolution. And, and um, Gillian, no doubt sounds a bit familiar. I mean, what we're really talking about too is the separation of powers. We're talking about the executive um, overriding the judiciary, but not only that, the you know the original definition of the state of Israel. I mean, this does sound like a really big thing, but does this all, mm -hmm. how are we going on this score? Would you say that human rights as well as women's rights have gone backwards here? Well, yes. Um, and I think, um, as a lawyer, I can point to the reasons for that. But I think, of course, the respect for human rights does, in a way, reflect the culture and the political environment. And we've had political leaders about since 2001 who have not respected fundamental freedoms and have demonised human rights. But if I can put that in more lawyer-like terms, um, I think Australians are rather surprised to know that we're the only democracy and the only common law country in the world that doesn't have even a legislated charter of rights. And what that has meant is that our courts have not been able to stand up to the government uh, because l Parliament, very often governments supported by oppositions, have passed laws which are an egregious breach of fundamental rights and the courts have not been, over, uh, been able to overturn that. One of the things that we've seen, and I, I understand there are some similarities uh, with, with Israel, that we've had um, Parliament, which represents the sovereignty of the people, but nonetheless Parliament passing laws that have granted to itself extensive levels of executive power and discretionary power that is not subject to judicial review. And what they've done is to cut the courts out of so many of the processes. Um, and that, of course, breaches. Um, we do have a constitution, but the constitution does not in the main deal with uh, fundamental freedoms. We do have a right to religious freedom in Australia in the Constitution, but most freedoms are not included in it. But there is one very important aspect of the Constitution, which is the separation of powers. And the reason we have that is that you have to have checks and balances. So you have the executive, and, the, um, and then you have parliament, and then you have the judges. And what a court, uh, the legislators, legislatures have been doing over the last 20 years is cutting the judges out with mandatory sentencing, so that they've got no choice. It's part of a sort of law and order, fear-based sort of analysis. Uh, but something that's... Th that can be understood. The public can see that happening. But, but to, for me to talk about separation of powers and development of executive discretion and powers, people sort of bla gla gla glaze over, over that. <laughs> they, don't, they, they just don't get it. And in Australia, we're not well-educated about these, about these things. But the problem is that it's given huge power to government that we've proper outside wartime we've never had. Now, if I could just take one more minute to drill down, it's that's all rather abstract, but with surprising similarities with Israel. But now we've got laws which I gather are also similar with Israel. We've got uh, on coming to Parliament in these two weeks before Christmas, because Mr. Dutton says they're urgent. We've now got proposed de-encryption rules that require companies to de-encrypt um, uh, uh, privacy issues. We've got um, foreign interference laws and new provisions that will, um, on so-called um, uh, prevention of foreign interference in elections, which on the street probably we most generally agree with. Um, sounds all right, but when you look at it in detail, what it's done is to set up a very, very rigorous process of registering charities, which will then be prosecuted if they don't meet the requirements. That plus unprecedented counter-terrorism legislation um, and uh, of, a, of an enormous kind. So if I can finish by saying we've got piece after piece after piece of legislation, much of it rushed through in those weeks before Christmas, that where the whole becomes larger than the sum of the parts. And it's very, in my view, very, very dangerous for Australian democracy that this is happening. But because the concepts that you're talking about, Sharon, as, as well as me, they, they seem abstract, <laughs> but they're actually <laughs> fundamental. And, and we have to stand up uh, to fight for those checks and balances if our democracy is going to survive in the way that we've, we've all hoped it would, it would be. Well, Israel's got a very blunt law um, 
currently in process, the override law. I mean, that, this mm. is sort of like, let's not mess around with the details, let's mm. just give a carte blanche to the so executive. So I said two things. There were two waves. The first wave was designated against NGOs and they are minority. And especially, I mean, the, when I say NGOs, it, is it was tailor-made against those organizations that are uh, criticizing Israel about their policy in the occupied territories. So it was really a uh, harm of freedom of speech. We don't want to hear these organizations around and we'll find different ways to oppress them. But the second wave, which is more dangerous and is happening now, is against the institutions mm. in general, especially against, su against Supreme Court and the legal advisors. Mm. And uh, the, you were mentioning the override clause. This is a law that is trying to be, the government just brought now, or legislator just brought now, s please notice I'm saying government and legislator as if it's the same mm -hmm. because there is a lot of similarities, mm -hmm. speaking about separation yeah. of powers. They're suggesting that Supreme Court would not have the power to strike down laws, saying the Supreme Court is very liberal. Now, le let's see, in the history of Israel, uh, there each year, Supreme Court will hear Thousands of cases. This is the Israeli system. Thousands of cases. They're all numeral, serial num numbers, so we know exactly how many. And we're speaking about 70 years of Israel. Okay, so thousand, uh, thousands of cases a year, 70 years. Only 15 case, 15 laws were struck down. One five, and it's really Supreme Court is really, really cautious when it's using it, speaking about the separation of powers and the power of the, le the legislator. And although they're very cautious, if you would ask me, I would say they're too cautious. Okay, I spoke, I mean, I did the name dropping of all our cases that we won, but believe me, we're losing a lot. We're losing a lot, but at the same time, I don't undermine the credibility of the Supreme Court as an institution. I hope it would be more liberal. But there's no question for the need of independence of the Supreme Court. And what is happening now by the government, they're, they're suggesting that the Supreme Court will have no powers to strike down laws. Will this we, bill go through, do you think? That's a question in prophecy, not in human No, but I, I mean, know. have they got the numbers? It's very dangerous. It's really scary. The Attorney General is under attack as well. There is, it's, it's, it's a set of laws. The override clause is one of them, but the other one is suggesting that legal advisors in the ministries won't be independent in you anymore. Okay, so there are many laws to limit the, the powers. Now, we call it the co uh, constitutional capture. Because you don't see a revolution, okay? Nobody's marching in the street, walls are not falling. It's not the revolutions as we, as we knew them. But at the same time, by legitimate le le legislation, you would say, oh, this is the majority. This is what they want. Right. Slowly, slowly, we are moving from a liberal democracy to illiberal democracy. And as I said, it's not happening only in Israel. In, in Israel. And I, uh, I read a very interesting uh, article by Eva Iluz, Professor Eva Iluz, and she, she said analyzing it, the Jews used to be minorities around the world for many, many years. And as minorities, they supported universal rights because they enjoyed the benefits of the notion of universal rights. But now, as a majority, the, we keep forgetting a little bit what does it mean to be a minority. And that reflects on the relationship between Jews in Israel and Jews around the world as well. But as, as back to Supreme Court, I'm, I'm very worried. I'm very worried. There is uh, a lot of uh, action and noise, and a lot of people are speaking about this in Israel. It's not only Supreme Court. We're dealing now with a law that is called loyalty and culture. Loyalty and culture, okay? You don't have to be a sophisticated lawyer to understand what does it mean, right? Loyalty and culture. You'll get, uh, we'll sponsor you as an institu institution, a theater. Look at this theater here. The sponsor, if you'll say that you are loyal to the government. We have a problem as a democracy, right? How can this be happening? What is, what is happening in civil society in, in the light of this? Are people rising up and saying enough? I mean, or, I suppose, as you say, it's a government representing the majority. They've been democratically elected. You know, maybe you can't disagree just because you don't like their laws. They're in government. But what's the, what's the response from Israeli society? If you want to get good art, try to harm the artists. In the past couple of weeks <laughs> in Israel, we get the best art to protest against this law. But not funded. Uh, no, I mean, it's... Uh, 
th there is a change in the public opinion. I can say for, for Akri, we have more Israelis that are standing up, calling us and saying, what can we do? Supporting us. So there is more rise. I mean, we, we saw when uh, 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 Prime Minister Netanyahu was attacking uh, the Israel Fund, there was a huge number of people and finance supporting the new Israel Fund because uh, everybody who cares about a liberal democracy is, is standing up now. So this is on the upside. The downside, we were discussing all the time. The mm. Do you think, Gillian, that we could see anything as blunt as an override law type situation here in Australia? Well, I was thinking about that as, as, as Sharon was speaking. Um, we don't have anything as obvious as, a, as, a, as an override rule, but we do have a, a, a position in Australia where the, the High Court and most courts, but particularly the High Court, which is our senior court, um, will say if Parliament has spoken with clarity in the legislation, then that will oust the common law rule. So that is why we have a High Court that has been in big majorities uh, a, a concluding that when Parliament passes a law that a person may, must be uh, detained without charge or trial indefinitely because they've arrived in Australia uh, by boat without a visa, uh, the High Court has found that to be constitutionally valid. Now, it actually breaches one of the most fundamental common law principles you could put your hand on. Back to the Magna Carta, right in the middle of the Magna Carta, along with how many sheep and cows you've got and what your obligations are to your feudal Lord is this extraordinary phrase, more than 800 years old. No man may be detained arbitrarily without charge or trial by his peers. And the tragedy for us in Australia with refugee migration policy is that the High Court um, has, f that we have no law in Australia that reflects that Magna Carta provision other than the common law. But the High Court has said if Parliament is clear and unambiguous in its language, then we will not override it. Now, it's not, as, it's not as obvious as an override clause, but that is what our High Court has been doing for the last 10 or 15 years. Now, our courts have not always been like that. We've had a remarkable court, for example, in the 80s that found that the principle of terra nullius, uh, that a, a land is, was unoccupied when, when, when we as colonists arrived, they simply overturned that provision and said it was bad law and didn't reflect reality, and they, they moved forward on basic common law principles. Um, our current courts tend to be much more conservative. So the principle of um, what's called parliamentary restraint has now gone away. In the past, over the decades, parliament would act with restraint so that it always acted consistently with common law and with international human rights law or any other international law for that matter. That restraint has now gone and it's become a, pu a purely political process which leads to the problem that you're speaking about. This idea of a majoritarian approach to democracy, whereas a fundamental principle of parliament and democracy is that it's a system that protects the minority as well as the majority. And, and that's missing in our understanding about contemporary democracy, I think. What changed? Why did that happen, do you think? Look, I have searched for why. I mean, you can give the, you can give the legal answer. We haven't got the tools, but no, it's not a good no. enough answer. Mm, I no. think the culture has changed in Australia, and I think we've had leadership that has demeaned and failed to support those fundamental principles. And, and it's that lack of, le I think the poor leadership, or leadership which is opportunistic in terms of its political objectives. R from the very early days, you'll all remember 2001, the ch throwing the children overboard, um, misstatement, Senate found it eight months later to be without a scintilla of evidence. But the Howard government used that to demonize asylum seekers and to demonize those of the Muslim faith. But it was the same year of, of the Tampa crisis when um, the, a ship's captain, a Norwegian, picked up these asylum seekers on the, on, the, on the high seas, brought them against government orders into the territorial waters of Australia and into the arms of the federal court uh, where their rights were upheld. And, the, and within weeks of that, we had 9-11 and the terrorist. And I think from that moment, if you're trying to find a sort of cultural change in the political environment in Australia, I think you can, you can, you can place that year as being the year with that particular government that then um, uh, built on this idea of, of a majority in parliament, but also built on threats uh, fear. 
And um, the, the phrase that I think has to be uh, just a few weeks ago, well, it must be a couple of months ago now, our former Prime Minister, Turnbull, was asked to explain why we have, we have a lot of Prime Ministers, I'm afraid, it's a bit hard to keep up. <laughs> but he was asked to explain why we have these counter-terrorism laws and new espionage laws and new laws registering charities and so on. And he, he didn't even grace the Australian public with, with, with an answer. He said... Dangerous times. Nothing more need mm. be said. And that, I think... Not even a sentence. Not even a sentence. No analysis, no information, mm. no facts, no, no reports, nothing. Just dangerous times. And I think that if we're trying to find out why we've moved in this way, certainly in Australia, but of course in many other countries as well, it's been this political use of fear... Uh, that has been so powerful that it's overturned many of the, or overridden many of the fundamental principles. Does that apply in Israel? And of course, Israel is one of the, this is one of the few discussions we can have as Australians where we're not, you know, we're almost racing to the bottom with mm. you on our treatment of asylum seekers, unfortunately. Yeah. Um, I gather that the, w the word in Hebrew translates as infiltrators. Is that yeah, right? Yeah, so, so the reason I, maybe I should have mentioned before, the override clause didn't come in a, in a vacuum. vacuum. The reason it came, the criticism Supreme Court got for being too active in the recent history, recently, was the case of asylum seekers that we represented and we, uh, we won. And the, the common thing, we're laughing at it, cynically saying that it was such a good case that we won three times. But again and again and again we had to win. So the story in Israel is, is like this, that uh, more during the beginning of the millennium, many people started walking the desert via Egypt. And, uh, sounds familiar, right? Walking the desert via <laughs> Egypt. Someone else has done it. Yeah. Someone else has done it once a year, <laughs> at least we read about it. Uh, uh, they came from Eritrea and Sudan. They weren't looking for the Holy Land. What happened, they were actually aiming to get to Italy, uh, and uh, the gates were closed in Italy. So they started walking the desert toward Israel, and at the time, the, uh, there was no barrier there, and they were walking into Israel. And we were speaking about 10,000 of people around 2009, 10, 11. Now, it's confusing because... Uh, we, we've been refugees 70 years ago, and you said, oh, refugees, we have to give them treatment. But at the same time, you know, not everybody was a refugee. There were people that were seeking a better future. Mm -hmm. They're hitchhikers, they're uh, migrant workers, and a country has the sovereignty not to allow citizenship to every person who, who wants it. So it really raises lots of questions. How, how do you deal with it? So the fact that I came to Australia with a tourist visa a couple of uh, days ago doesn't mean that I can become a citizen tomorrow, and, and it's fair enough. So how do we deal with it? Uh, international treaties in the recent, the recent history for refugees was written in our, around 1948, post-World War II, for us. Our world is sitting together and say, this catastrophe that just happened to us couldn't happen anymore. Let's decide together about things that we are doing together. If people are fleeing from a war area, we are not sending them back. We are helping them. We are assisting them. Okay, how do we do it? A due process. The problem in Israel was that there was no due process. There was no, I mean, okay, you get into Israel after you walk the desert, went through terrible things, you were a real refugee, you get into no possibility to submit requests. So we challenged uh, this to, for the first time. The Minister of Interior said, you know, people are walking. Help them. Don't leave them in this limbo. So the government of Israel said, okay, we'll start screening requests and see if it's legal. And then in 2011 said, okay, we'll arrest these people. We'll put them in prison. And until when? Until they'll, they'll say that they, they're fed up with it and they're willing to go back to their home countries. Sounds familiar. Very familiar. Uh, <laughs> What, for how long? When is it expire? Never. We took it to Supreme Court and we won for the first time. Prisoning refugees is unconstitutional. Great. The government said, okay, Supreme Court was intervening here, very, being very active. This is the interpretation of what they were saying. We will change the law. 
we are not going to put pe people in prison. We'll put them in an open detention center. What's an open detention center? It's across the street from the... There are no streets in the middle of the desert, three hours drive from Tel Aviv. It's the other hill, across the hill from the, the, the prison that was there. And it's an open, no, no gates. The only thing is that you need to sign three times a day over there. So basically, you're stuck in a prison. The gates are open, but you can't go anywhere. You're getting your meals there. And so we challenged it. And wh for how long are you staying there? Unlimited time until you sign up that you want to go back to your home country. We challenged it in Supreme Court, and we won. <laughs> Supreme Court says this is unconstitutional. Second time, right? So successful case. So uh, the, the legislator changed the law again and said it's going to be limited for three years, and, uh, and it became a revol revolving door. They would detain people. They would go, people that were living already 10 years in Israel, okay? They would go to this detention center, they would stay, and they would come out. We challenged it again in Supreme Court, and we won again. This detention center, we managed to close it last April. It was shut down. Nobody's going there. So this is a huge success in human rights. <laughs> It is. is uh, all the uh, appreciation to the best lawyers in the, wor in the world that are working in the Association for, uh, for the Civil Rights in Israel. Really, I have a very good staff and people that were actually working really hard on this. And uh, it's together with other organizations. This is a big case. And the state, by the way, to justify uh, its position was relying on the Australian law. <laughs> trying to show how it's being That's done around terrible. the world, yes. Um, it, just before I ask you about that, Gillian, you also had an example very familiar to us here, um, a policy of expelling asylum seekers or attempting to to third countries. Yeah, so we that. finished in April, we yep. closed, we shut it down. So what do you do with all these people? Now we're speaking about 34,000 people that are uh, in Israel. Uh, just to go back to the process of recognition in the uh, refugee status, out of 7,000 Sudanese that are in Israel, any idea how many were approved as real refugees? One, exactly one, yeah. One person, Mutase uh, Mali. Out of the uh, Eritreans, only 0.5% were recognized. The average recognition rate in other countries like Greece and European countries is, is up to 80%, 80. So either all the cheaters came to Israel or we have a problem with our system. And the, the law is called infiltration law. Oh, that's so what again, that is. Yeah, the infiltration law. So we, we are calling it asylum seekers. It's narratives as well. We call it refugees and asylum seekers. These are infiltrators in the language of the, the government. Now what Israel is trying to do, this is really interesting because Israel do not send them back to their home countries. Okay, remembering we were refugees. So it's not breaching international law and not sending them back to their home countries where there are wars. So there is an understanding that it's problematic, but at the same time, trying to make their life really miserable. And now it's trying to extradite them to a third country. This was the name in court, third country. Later on, we learned in the papers, so I'm allowed to say it now, that it's Rwanda. And uh, Rwanda was offered to get so and so thousand uh, dollars for each head that Once they were accept. In the moment, it was published in the media. Uh, Rwanda backed off and said, "We're not going to do it." Uh, so they're now in Israel uh, in a limbo. What will happen next? Stay tuned. I suppose I just <laughs> I know there's probably a night's worth of conversation you could have on that, Gillian. But I mean. What do you think when you hear this from Sharon? Well, I, I say, aren't you lucky to have that Supreme Court? <laughs> because our High Court has approved all of these processes and found them to be constitutional. Mm. And when you lose that, the highest court of the land, approving offshore processing, and indeed, just to give you an example, we have a provision in our Migration Act that says that if you return somebody contrary to the principle of non refoulement in the Refugee Con uh, Convention, that does not constitute a breach of Australian law. So that the, if an officer returns someone to Myanmar or to Afghanistan, um, <coughs> where they are at, at risk of persecution, 
then that is explicitly not an offence under our migration law. So you, it, we, like uh, it is extraordinary how itself. far we yes. have moved. But, but we are very isolated in Australia, and it's, perhaps it's not always understood. Um, but while you are sort of in the middle of the Middle East, you, you've got a, a lot of connection with North America, with Britain, with Europe, um, and therefore must at least keep some nominal um, uh, compliance with these fundamental principles, to say nothing, of course, of the, of the background to the, the establishment of, the of Israel. Yeah. In this country, we have been enormously fortunate, but we have drifted away from the jurisprudence and the law of the countries that we would typically be associated with. And that is why we've become so exceptionalist and, uh, and isolated from the jurisprudence that even your own court is adopting. Um, I mean, we do appalling things. Um, we still have about 600 men on Manus who have been there more than five years. Mm -hmm. We still have families and 17 children now on Nauru who have been there for five and a half years. And we have 1,300 people in immigration detention in detention centres around Australia. Um, but also, and a problem that I think we have yet to realise in Australia, because we've been rather focused on getting the children off Nauru, it's been yeah. a big political thing and that's slowly happening. Uh, but what we haven't yet thought about is that we've got about 25,000 people in Australia who will never have permanent settlement here, whose claims have never been assessed. So, as you say, the usual, even, uh, ironically, Papua New Guinea and Nauru did the right thing and they did assess claims to refugee status. And on average, it's about 85% uh, meet the legal definition, with some who do not. In Australia, we put a freeze for several years on assessing the claims at all. Um, that, that, but the bar on those claims was lifted in, on, in October last year. Many people didn't meet the, meet the application time. I, I won't go into too much detail, but the tragedy is that we've now got thousands and thousands of families in Australia who live in a legal twilight zone where their claims to refugee status are not even being assessed, no, where they have um, their, their allowances cut and their, their housing taken away from them. Um, and they have, uh, 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 live in a world of absolute impermanence where at best they will get a temporary protection visa. They will never, under government policy, be given a permanent detention. Uh, so the... the in summary, the, the practices have been to break these people and to get them to go back. Um, and very, very few ever do. So they live in this, this impermanent and discriminatory environment. And it's starting to show up with the, in the medical practices and the hospitals and the schools who are wrapping around these children and their families. But, but very, very tragic circumstances. And, um, but but the, the ray of light is that there's been a huge change in thinking in Aust the Australian public over the last few months, and we've just had a survey of 80% now say we must bring people back from these offshore processing oh, centres wow. back into Australia. You anticipated my next question, because of course we always do try to end with some form of hope before we get to questions, so not that there's that much tonight, but um, do you think that, or you also say in your book, and I think we, we all saw this last time there was a processing centre at Nauru and Manus, it's as if we do it and then we inflict maximum pain and then we end up bringing them back mm, to Australia always. anyway. Um, you know, a whole lot of needless suffering, really. But do you think that the fact that we are probably going to get most of those people off Nauru, at least, does reflect a change in public opinion and the government reading that? I think it, I think it does. Um, and that, that's positive, but it's, it's the five and a half years that's starting to resonate in the public yes. mind. But I wonder if I could just take two minutes to give you one positive story about Australian law, because I've been pa painting a very grim picture. Um, but we do have federal court judges who are braver than our senior courts. And many Australians will know that we've had a lot of children on Nauru in particular where they're suicidal, they're declining in um, mental and physical condition over, over many, many, many years. And uh, then about 20 of them are on, or have been on, um, on, a, on a, a, a food watch so that they're forced to take liquids and so on. But one of the many, many cases concerned a boy about nine who um, a year ago was suicidal. He'd attempted suicide on a number of occasions. The medical officers were very worried about him, appalling physical and mental condition. And they pleaded with the, with the Australian government, with the minister, Mr Dutton, to allow that child and his mother to come to Australia. And for nine months, they refused. But then pro bono lawyers, rather like your um, civil rights group, here in Australia, in Melbourne, the Human Rights Law Centre, took an action, pro bono litigation, to the federal court, a single judge in Sydney, 
and they argued um, for uh, this medical care to be given to this child. And the federal court judge didn't talk about any of the things that I love to talk about, um, uh, charters of rights or the international human rights, the convention on the rights of the child, none of that. He went for a very simple common law principle. He said there is a common law obligation on the government, a duty of care to that child because the child was within the jurisdiction, effective jurisdiction, of Australia. And therefore, that common law principle of, of many, many um, uh, decades, in fact, centuries, millennia, uh, 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 provenance was to be uh, complied with. So uh, Mr Dutton was ordered to bring that child to Australia with his mother for medical treatment. But then he did something that I've never seen a judge ever do. What he did was to check the flight schedule. <laughs> and he found that there was a plane from Nauru to Darwin the next day. And in the end of the judgment, he said, uh, the Ministry of Home Affairs, Mr Dutton, um, I expect to see that child on that plane with his mother tomorrow. Wow. Now, that was, that, I mean, that's just one example. But this really is a battle between the judiciary and the legislature but it and the executive, isn't it? Because he's saying, exactly. I'm telling you, Mr Dutton, you get that kid exactly. on that plane. And, yeah. and interestingly enough, the government didn't appeal the matter uh, and the child was brought, as I understand, to Australia. So th where there are ways of finding a solution that's humane and consistent with fundamental principles, but we don't have the tools uh, through a, a leg We'll never get a constitutional charter in Australia, or not in my lifetime, but we could get a legislated charter, and that is what we would like to have, to give our courts the power to do what really the Israeli Supreme Court has the power to do. For a little before while longer. Before, before the overall before they, <laughs> We might at this point go and turn over to your questions. Um, I think there are some microphones coming around. If It's a bit hard. Sorry, the light's in my eyes. Would you, anyone Has anyone got a question yeah. would, would, over here? And, and when I say questions, you know that familiar thing. It's a, <laughs> a little thing with a question mark on the end, not a big <laughs> statement, because we'd like to get through as many as we can. Well, it, it is um, uh, a question about um, this left-right divide and, um, uh, and human rights. Uh, and I went to the annual general meeting of uh, Liberty Victoria last week, at which there was the Alan Misson oration. Now, Alan Misson was a senator. He was a liberal senator. Um, and he was a great supporter of human rights. People like Alan Goldberg, who was also a past president of the... Uh, of, of uh, Liberty Victoria was a human rights advocate. Um, people like Petra Giorgio mm -hmm. um, of the Liberal Party was. Um, nowadays, it seems to me that the right treats huma uh, hu human rights issues as something of the left. But that's not always been the case, and it seems to me that it shouldn't be. Would you like to comment on that left-right divide? Well, I'll, I'll comment very briefly because I, I um, one night, I, I, one aspect that we haven't been able to explore too much, Sharon, is the, you did raise it though, and that is attacks on democratic institutions. And there were very serious attacks um, in Australia on the Australian Human Rights Commission, but also on the ABC, on the, on the regulatory bodies in the, in the financial area and so on, attacks by government. Um, so this has been a particular f phenomenon, but things were not good for me, uh, and I got a phone call 10 o'clock one night from Malcolm Fraser. And he said, Malcolm Fraser here, and I sort of <laughs> sat up, <laughs> and he said, I'm writing, um, uh, I'm writing a, an op-ed on asylum seeker um, refugee issues, and you may know that, that whatever you think of his politics, he was a strong supporter of human rights and was a very serious candidate for the Secretary General of the um, Commonwealth, of, uh, Commonwealth of Nations, as it then was. Anyway, he rang me up and he said, I'm just checking, I want to check the facts and the details and what about this and what about that. Um, and uh, it was getting pa well past my bedtime and I was thinking, well, I've answered all your questions, maybe we should go to bed. But I got a long, a long history of all various anecdotes of life in Parliament and so on. Um, and finally put the phone down. A highly lucid and wonderful piece appeared in the paper the following day. And very sadly, he died two weeks later. So I, I'm so uh, fond of that memory of, of him. But I raised that point. Of course, that has been... If you look back over Australia's history until that turning point in 2001, up until then, we were a good international citizen and we did it, we believed in human rights across party lines and we, we were out there 
punching well above our weight in negotiating all of those treaties. The Refugee Convention, the um, International Covenant on Civil and po Political Rights, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, of which we celebrate the 70th anniversary now, was very, very strongly uh, promoted by um, that remarkable man, Doc Evatt, um, uh, at the request of Eleanor Roosevelt. Um, so, uh, but you're quite correct, and that has been the tragedy, that we supported this right up until uh, after the creation of the uh, Rome Statute for the International Criminal Court, right up until uh, the Howard years of 2001, and I'd love us to go back to those principles and those values again, because for me, they 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 underpin Australia's contemporary democracy. Well, what you're talking about there too, and we did skip over that because I think we sort of went somewhere else, but um, the attacks on you at the Human Rights Commission are very much what Shachon has talked about as the attacks on gatekeeper institutions in Israel. What, what sort of institutions have been attacked there? So, uh, first of all, I want to relate to the right-left. I think in Israel, the elephant in the room is the occupation, which, mm. uh, by from my perspective, it's a violation of, of human rights, of the life of Palestinians, people that cannot vote or decide on, on their life. This became a big thing in, in Israel in terms of right-left of and gave uh, leverage to attacks on human rights organizations that were... Uh, uh, calling to end the occupation. So uh, this, is, this is one thing, big thing in the division of left and right. I think as, a, as someone who supports universal human rights, you have to be consistent. So administrative detention, for example, which is uh, detaining without a due process legal. We were for many years against it. We are still against it was used many years against Palestinians. And then we were undermined, uh, we were criticized, saying, oh, you support Palestinians, that's why you are against it. But recently, it's being used, the right, right-wing settlers in Israel, Jewish settlers. And we are consistent. This is not a good procedure. This is a procedure that shouldn't happen. So this is about being consistent. But go in, in the global way, I'm moving from, again, about liberal democracies. I think as a, as in globalization, as a, Human beings, we have a short memory because after World War II, we were all very liberal and very much for human rights. And now we, we the general, we has kind of tend to forget and then go getting back because the world is statistically doing a lot better. I mean, not if you live in a specific state in Africa, but in general, we have less diseases, less wars. We are doing better. All of us have refrigerators at home. It's not a question, y yes or no. I mean, here and uh, there's more nationalism around the world and keep forgetting the, the others. So I think this is part of the division, left, left and right. And the imbalance, for me, it's something, again, to my personal or collective history in most of this room, is we were refugees. It's every generation a person must see himself as if he went to exile from Egypt. As I said, there's a lot to talk about on every level here tonight. I've got a question here. Thank a you. Uh, Sharon, uh, is it possible for Israel to be Jewish and democratic? <laughs> this is a problem wow, with a proper a question. Yeah. <laughs> so, I don't know. I'm doing, I mean, I, I don't know <laughs> this is the answer. I'm doing my best as a human rights lawyer to make sure that minorities will be guaranteed their rights. Chief Justice Saron Barak uh, used to say that the, his, his division was that uh, before the door, the entry to the country, you give preference to Judaism by the law of return, but inside the country, it's equality for everybody. Uh, this is one of the interpretations that was respected. The nation state bill is changing it completely now that it's recently passed and is saying it gives uh, priority to the Jewish state. Uh, I don't know, it's complicated. Uh, I'm doing my best. <laughs> <laughs> Other question anywhere? Uh, I've got a hand over here on the side, on the left hand side, halfway up, no? Uh, um, yeah, he's getting, yeah, he's getting the mic. So Ron yeah. talked about the tyranny of the majority, um, but I wonder if it's really the majority that represents, that approves of all the things that are being done by our governments now. Are, are they being led through in secret and we actually oppose them? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> uh, I take that one as a comment. <laughs> yeah, I think. A comment. Uh, 
it's it's hard to know things are being done by the government that uh I, I'm not sure that all the majority is supported. As I said, I mean, part of the optimism that ma many people, that, uh, some of them were gatekeepers are, until recently, are speaking up now. Y only last week there was op-ed and public letters by previous Attorney General, including uh, Chief Justice Barak, they're saying this is unheard of, the behavior of the government at this stage, and this is not democracy. So we are questioning ourselves many questions now, and I, I think w what I can do is, is to speak about it, I think, to express the freedom of speech, <coughs> to have a conversation in the public sphere. Part of the thing that I'm really worried about is the chilling effect. So when legislation is passed like this, like the entry law to Israel that are saying that if you criticize Israel, maybe you won't allow to get into, people will think twice before they're traveling or coming or th th they're sitting at home w with their personal Facebook, which is out there, and think twice before pressing the enter. Or even conversations in, a, in an era that we have shallower than, than before. Twitter is 280 digits, right? I mean, you can't put a whole dissertation or complicated ideas in 280 digits. Yes, no, maybe. Somebody told me in, uh, in 2014, when I, I just stepped into this position, there was a uh, uh, protective edge. Uh, uh, we had a war in Gaza, another war. And there were lots of fight on the social network, which the world has changed. Many people moved to the social workers. And somebody from Facebook told me that uh, it uh, that the, a very common trend was the unfriend. Okay, so I don't want to hear you anymore, shut you down. So we don't have conversation, and I think this is part of the problem, problem in, in democracy. And thank you very much for coming to hear us for an hour <laughs> speaking about all these things. You know? I mean, we've had some examples here with the ABC. Do you think there's a sort of chilling effect on discussion and um, speaking out for human rights here, or are we experiencing a renaissance? Well, I do feel very heartened by last night's election, actually. <laughs> I'm beginning to think maybe, maybe we are in the progressive yeah. heartland <laughs> of Australia. Congratulations, Victoria. I yeah. think um, uh, uh, there's no doubt at all that, that at a political level, there is a denigration of women in the public arena. Um, we've seen that in the, in the ABC, but I think there's a denigration of our public institutions where they support speaking up um, in various ways. So I think that's very damaging. Uh, but at the same time, I think, I think Australians are starting to see how dangerous this is becoming. Um, and the, the public appetite, for, you know, to come out on a Sunday night and listen to, <laughs> listen to us, but it's, typical, it's happening all over Australia. And I think, I think that's very encouraging. And one of the things I'm talking about is, as citizens, let us take back our citizenship responsibilities. Because I think we've just allowed all of that to go on in Canberra uh, without following it. Uh, and I think we, it's time we started to uh, follow it more closely, demand explanations, demand evidence-based policies. Uh, and, I, and I think Australians are coming, coming to that position. So I'm optimistic for next year. Got any, got any more questions? Uh, hello. Thank you very much to both of you. Um, my question, I think, is more to Gillian. Um, we, following on from what you just said, and in contrast to the first question, um, I think these days fear I on both sides is what's driving the gender and advocating and advocacy of policies. Um, and it's both sides. It's not left-right issue. Mm, that's so right. therefore, that's right. um, even if we vote for a party that might be more progressive, how do we overcome the fear specifically around asylum seekers? Well, um, you're quite right in saying that one of the great difficulties over the last 10 or so years has been that both major parties have... Um, have uh, uh, been lockstep really on asylum seeker issues and using fear as a basis for justifying it and justifying the horrible binary, the false binary, that you have to hold children and their families in detention indefinitely in order to stop the boats and save the drownings at sea. Um, I think, Sharon, you, you re used, no, made reference to the, the importance of language, the, the, the word, the it's infiltrator. Um, it, it, it's it, the, the, the brilliance of the slogan has been so powerful in Australia that nobody can get it out of their mind. Um, but I think we have to work harder to break that binary because it's simply a false binary. You can 
treat people according to the law and humanely, and you can save lives at sea, and you can protect our national borders in an appropriate way. However, to answer your question, um, if we were to get a change of government, and I'm always optimistic, then I think we will have um, a change in policy eventually, but it won't happen quickly, um, because I think there there will still be this need to uh, use the language of national security, and I think you'll see that uh, the opposition leader, Mr. Shorten, is sticking very much to that language. Um, I don't think we'll see change very very quickly, but I think we will probably, as uh, Deborah has suggested, we'll see these children and their families brought to Australia and the men off Manus. That will happen, I, th I think, over the next two or three years. It's a horrible, horrible situation for them to be in, but I think it'll happen. But uh, I think there's an opportunity for a new government to um, to uh, to rethink these thing these uh, policies. But I think it takes courageous leadership. And, and that's, I, we can only wait and see because we've all been disappointed so many times. Changing governments does not always lead to the, a new outcome and uh, that's been a tragedy. But if we have courageous leadership prepared to stand up for the values and principles on which Australia is founded, then I think we've got some hope for the future and that's really my, my, uh, my view for next year. Courageous leadership. Courageous leadership. Well, let's hope for that. Yeah. Have we got <laughs> one more question? Uh, gentlemen, here... Yeah, oh, okay, I'll, you're, I'll leave it to you, Sharon. You. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, Go ahead. Um, the way, sorry, this one's addressed to, addressed to Gillian. Um, the way you were treated in the public um, space with regards to um, your office, I'd uh, like you to comment a bit on that. <laughs> well, again, I suspect, Sharon, we, we, we've both had a chance to speak before this evening, and I think we've, we've both been subject to this. Um, look, I think one point that I, uh, uh, writing the book, as a matter of fact, um, really taught me this. Uh, it was never, ever about me. Um, it was always a, an ideological attack on human rights and on the Australian Human Rights Commission. And I think I just got under their skin with, um, with our reports on Dondale juvenile detention, on, of course, the Forgotten Children's Report, which was about the children kept on, on Nauru and their mental and physical health, health across Australia. Um, I think I just got under their skin, and um, I think I just I just had to wear it. Really, it was um, it was very unpleasant, uh, and to have the prime minister and the, the attorney saying the things they said was you know reverberate through my brain even now when I'm digging in my vegetable patch. I think how did I ever manage it? But but I I, I was actually talking to a psychologist the other day, and I, I said this probably isn't recommended by psychologists, but I just got so angry. I was so angry that we had the, the law right, we had our research and the facts right, the medical profession came with us on all of, our, all of our work around Australia. I was so certain that we'd done the work and all the staff of the Commission had done the work, that if I were to back down uh, in any way at all, I would not only let them down and the Australians down, because that was my job as President, and I'd have let myself down very badly. Um, it did occur to me in my sort of more feminine moments that when I was being attacked in Senate estimates, I could faint or burst into tears. But I actually decided that if I'd been as, as rude to them as they were to me, I would have lost my case. It would have been on public television. Mm -hmm. You would all have seen it, and you would have had, you would be, not had the same level of respect. But I think trying to put the legal argument along with the indisputable facts of the condition of these children and their families, ultimately, along with the work of many, many other people, has cut through, so it was worth it. But it was very, very unpleasant. I mean, I'd been pretty well unknown in the Australian scene for 45 years, and suddenly you burst into, uh, into notoriety. Uh, but it taught me the, this point that, of course, the United Nations is raising all the time, that the attacks now are ideological attacks on human rights defenders, um, I mean, I, I'm alive and well and um, able to have my gin and tonic that I write about in the book. But I, <laughs> but I, but many, many are not. They're killed or, or diminished in all sorts of ways. And I think we have to remember that it's a global phenomenon that you attack the messenger, and we have to stand up against it. And uh, I'm again, that's another reason I'm, I'm so pleased to, to have met you and to realise that uh, so many around the world are suffering this. And I think we just have to stand up and uh, speak up and hope to bring people with us, um, uh, not on ideological grounds, but on, on the grounds that these principles, as you say, inequality diminishes all of us. Mm 
uh, and, and that's what we have to, I think, work for. Of course, the big difference which brings us back to... <laughs> in a sense, why we're here tonight and, and, and having you here, Sharon, is... And I wonder what, what you think about this. Well, Gillian, your organisation was funded by the government, but does the fact that ACRI gets its funding and support from outside the government give you an added strength and some independence? Of course. <laughs> so, Which is um, why it's so important. Um, th there are a couple of things. Um, I uh, started my way at ACRI as a legal intern in 2000, and it was time that the uh, Israel was, was more liberal in, in many ways. The government was uh, Rabin's uh, government in the beginning of the uh, in, in the beginning of the 90s, and Supreme Court court was more liberal and independent. The, and I was treated by my friends, colleagues in general, like a hero. Wow, you work for a human rights organization? That's wonderful. Uh, 20 years later, it's not the same. So people will look and say, oh, really, human rights organization? Oh. So I think the public opinion has shifted. When I'm speaking about sh shrinking democratic spaces, th th this is the thing, you know, it's, it's shifted. And there are question marks in the delegitimization it's very big. Are you working against the government? No, I'm pro-Israel because I think this is the Israel I want to see. The Israel I want to see is democratic, is justice, is uh, have equality for everybody, respecting minority, respecting women, and uh, and this is something to to struggle for. And I think it's it's terrible if we give up on the on the hope on the the notion. And uh, there, there are a couple of things that uh, support and give me optimism in, in terms, in, in a hard time for democracies. I mean, my, my trip here in, in Australia, is, uh, I, I was not that much familiar, I did some reading, but I was not that much familiar with, with everything. And there are many similar similarities. I mean, refugees, wow, institution, independence, so many things. I'm sitting in an inter international body called INCLO, International Civil Liberties Organizations, organizations like us uh, from uh, ACLU is sitting there, the US, uh, Hungary, Canada, South Africa, India, Russia, and others. And uh, we see phenomena, we connect the dots, and we mm, see things yeah. that are happening around the world. Uh, freedom of protest, it's, it's worse than it used to be. Mm. You know, uh, we don't, Governments uh, do not want to hear protesters uh, as we conceived it before, as if, as if it was uh, possible. So there are many things to address, and I think the, the answer is to speak up, to bring people out, uh, to, to keep the, the spark, the, the, the fire, and to, to fight for it. I, I don't have really other option. I mean, I'm raising uh, my daughters in Israel, and uh, I... Uh, in terms of the political questions, I don't see the the state of Israel disappearing. I don't see the Palestinian disappearing. None of us is going to jump to the sea and start swimming. We're going to live together, and we'll have to sort it out somehow with respecting human rights. And uh, uh, I don't think there is a real military or power solutions to the disputes. And part of the delegitimization that we are going through is is about our treatment to the uh, minority. So there is tension between security reasons to human rights. And I live in a, t in a rough neighborhood. I mean, I can't say that everything is terrific and there are no security threats. There are security threats around the, in Israel and the world at all. I mean, the world is not what it used to be 20 years ago. At the same time, security reason cannot cover or justify any... Uh, a violation of human rights. This cannot be an the answer for everything. We are, we are scared it must be security reasons. I, it is impossible. It's not a justification for collective punishment for people just because of their origins. And uh, I think we have to, uh, to stand up, to speak up about it, to discuss it. And I'm, uh, it's hard times. I mean, I mean I'm getting back, it was easier 20 years ago to speak <coughs> about human rights, but at the same time, it's a work that must be done. Mm. I'm told we're allowed to have one or two more questions if there are any. And I'm um, Sharon, have you got somebody? 
I can't see. Uh, is, uh, um, uh, this question is basically for Gillian. Um, uh, I think you're right to say that it, it's been a kind of culture of fear. That, uh, but it's interesting to ask, fear of what? Because in 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 the in in regard to let's say the terror the change of laws because of terrorism, it would seem it's a fear of of life. I mean, of being killed or injured. Uh, but. And even allowing for the fact that human beings are irrational about statistics, right? so it's, you're more in danger of getting killed in your car than by a shark and so on. In those sort of cases, there's not much at stake. But what's been at stake here is, as, as you've been pointing out, uh, is, is, is the character of our civic life. Mm -hmm. And what's paradoxical, I think... Is this uh, a question? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, sorry, let me ask you. Sorry. Do, do you really think that we're a, a, a nation of such cowards that it's 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 for the sake of the, a, a slim chance of being killed that we're prepared to overturn all the values that we cherish, and which I think paradoxically the same people would if were if those values were challenged by a foreign power would enlist to fight mm -hmm. and risk their lives. Mm -hmm. So I, my, my question is, is it really a simple, a simple case of a failure of civic courage? Or is there something else going on? Oh, I, I, I definitely I don't, don't think... I don't think that, it's that we're genuinely... Um, I don't think we're cowards at all. But I think that we've been misled by these, by these slogans um, about defending our borders and terrorism... And we have been lied, frankly, we've been lied to by our politicians over and over and over again. And we now have grossly disproportionate laws so that we spend billions a year on, um, on uh, 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 coastal shipping under, under the um, home security laws, along with the vast sums of money on the offshore detention centres, but putting that to one side, um, where we have very, very few uh, terrorist incidents in Australia. Maybe many are foiled, I don't know. But when you put that against the fact that the figure was released last, year, uh, last week, that 62 women were killed uh, in domestic violence, killed by their partners or former partners, and, and let's put that in context, uh, 25 children are killed, uh, men are killed as well. Um, but we have an enormous level of social and economic um, problems in Australia that we, we put very, very small sums of mon money towards. We, the refuges have been closed down. The community legal services have had their budgets cut. Uh, all the mechanisms that might be there to assist families in trouble are, are being, being uh, taken away uh, and diminished, and indeed diminished in the public arena when you have politicians talking about uh, you know, the people cheating on welfare and so on. I mean, it's a very common argument. But to get back to your point, um, I think we are being driven by fear and being driven by misleading politicians who, who persist in 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 uh, in making in in, in uh, talking about these these um, uh, threats to Australian democracy uh, without any evidence of it or very little evidence. So that the the the, the most recent piece of legislation, the foreign interference laws. Um, I think a sort of dog whistle to sort of anti-Chinese spirit. But, I mean, this is happening all the time. Um, I think Australians, of course, will stand up for these values. And, and, and that's why I've been doing a lot of public speaking in the last 15 months or so and travelling all over Australia, a lot of rural groups um, as well. And uh, I think Australians are really challenging governments now and saying, we, we, you've misled us for long enough. Uh, we now need evidence-based policies and we will stand up for them. So I am optimistic, ultimately, um, uh, that we will stand up for those values. Gillian, you've brought it back to something optimistic. I might give the last word here to Sharon. Optimistic. Uh, so you, uh, in, at least in Israel, there is a real reason, perhaps, to fear for your security. Yeah, in, in terms of optimistic, I, I referred to this, that in the past year we both the Association for Civil Rights in Israel and the uh, New Israel Fund is gaining more support within Israel uh, than before. So liberal values, people are standing up and saying we need to discuss it. Uh, on other level, when we joined the OECD, uh, to, to we were asked to integrate into the job market the our minority and the ultra-Orthodox uh, 
uh, minority, and I think there is a huge difference today in the economy in terms of participation in the job market. There is a high jump in the participation of Arab women students for in universities. This is something we haven't seen before. And I think the reality on the ground, people want to live and want to have better life in many ways. And in the reality on the ground is being changed despite uh, some attempts. But we still, we have to stay awake and not only watch reality shows. Mm -hmm. <laughs> On that point, <laughs> thank you both very much.